Hey there, Caleb Ogic here, and welcome to episode 75 of my podcast. And in this episode, it's going to be a little different. It's actually just going to be me the whole time. I'm not interviewing anyone. I don't have anyone else sitting here with me. My dog, Pippa, is back there, probably creeping behind me. But in this episode, I'm just going to be talking about me, which which sounds weird to say, but basically my story. How did I go from college to a corporate job that I didn't really like that much and then starting to work for another entrepreneur and eventually starting my own business and launching my filmmaking and video production company career and eventually launching SwitchPod and this YouTube channel and podcast and and everything. So this episode, it's just going to be me interviewing myself. So if you already know me well, um, maybe you'll learn something. And if you don't know me at all, this should be a good introduction to just kind of me, my background, and and where I got to where I am right now. I was born in 1986, which makes me 32. Yes, we're going that far back, but I'll quickly go through childhood and growing up and that sort of thing. And then we'll get into more of the professional stuff. So grew up in Northern Michigan in a town called Petoskey. So I'm repping this shirt in this episode. And I specifically was kind of a independent kid. I was part nerd, part athlete. I played a lot of sports. I was in things like math counts and quiz bowl, but I also went to States for tennis and played soccer and basketball and baseball and every, every sport I basically could try. And I eventually went to college at Michigan State University because it was in state, which made it cheaper, but also my dad went there and my sister went there and I really got a good vibe when I attended it as, as just like a tour and to get, to get a feel for it. And I ended up majoring in two different things. So I have two bachelor's degrees. One is in the business college at Michigan State, which is a supply chain management degree, which is logistics and how products get made and all that kind of stuff, which is actually now helping me with SwitchPod quite a bit, uh, which is pretty ironic. And I also had another degree in the telecommunications department, which was with the subtitle of digital media and technology, which back then, you know, I was in college from... 2004 to 2008. Back then, that was trying to design websites using Dreamweaver and hard coding HTML. There was some video editing using Final Cut 7 or iMovie. And I, tried, I dabbled in computer animation and things like that. But basically, everyone told me at that stage, it's really hard to break into video, into film, into TV. And it was. The internet wasn't as big then. YouTube wasn't even a thing when I started college. So I really picked my two degrees as this one here, telecommunications, is going to be something fun that I do to kind of have fun in college. And then the other one, supply chain management, is going to be something that I choose to get a job. Because at Michigan State, it was always ranked number one or number two in supply chain management as the top school for that major. So I knew that companies, Fortune 500 companies, big manufacturing companies were going to come to Michigan State and recruit for that major. This is based on a conversation I had with another kid in honors college orientation, him coming in knowing already that that's what he was going to major in. That influenced me to major in it as well. So the reason that I was so focused on trying to get a degree that would just get me a job was not because of the impending, uh, basically financial collapse of 2008, 2009, just the world economy. Thankfully I did pick a major that was in demand because I got a job in May of 2008, right when the economy was kind of tanking, but it was because I just always wanted to be able to afford a family to, not be poor, to not have to live frugally, to not have to wonder where money is going to come from. And I thought the best way to do that was to get a stable corporate cubicle nine to five job with benefits and with a 401k and health insurance and just job security. But what ended up happening is right when I got my job in May of 2008. I went to work for the Boeing company in Seattle, Washington. I'd interned for them 
uh, the summer before. I'd also interned for General Motors the summer before that and did some study abroad in Japan. But right when I got to that job, the global economy kind of started to collapse. And what my role was as a person that was doing financial forecasting, I was in charge of these staffing spreadsheets. And there's about 600, 700 people at the factory I worked at in Seattle for Boeing. And my spreadsheets had different rows for each of the different departments at my factory, each with a manager attached to those or a senior manager. And then going to the right on the spreadsheet was the numbers going down of how many people at the factory were going to have jobs in a few months because Boeing announced that they were going to lay off somewhere between 7,500 and 10,000 people to downsize. This was a company that had 140, 150,000 people worldwide. So that meant every single arm of the business pretty much was having to let people go. So I had numbers in my spreadsheet that, you know, in, in general, when you're looking at a spreadsheet at a job, it might not mean anything to you. But once those numbers were individual people, that had a big impact on me mentally to be like, some of these people have been at this company for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. And because of something outside of their control, the global economic collapse and airlines not wanting to buy new planes because people maybe aren't traveling as much and all these things that are interconnected with the economy are impacting these people that have committed their lives to this corporation. And I'm not trying to call out Boeing. I'm not trying to call out anyone, really. I know that when you run a business, there are slow times, there are fast times, and you're going to have to make hard decisions like this to, to be profitable. And that kind of flipped a switch in me of, oh, maybe this isn't necessarily how I can best take care of myself financially and a, a future family. And from that point forward, I really focused on learning about personal finance and getting out of debt. I had about $28,000 of debt. Um, 18,000 of that was student loans and 10,000 of that was a car that I bought right after college um, to move across the country. And so I was really focused on personal finance. And then as I was learning about that through blogs and podcasts and books and all the other resources that I was going through, I kind of stumbled into entrepreneurship. I never really thought about wanting to run my own business, partially because I had seen the ups and downs of that through my father, who ran two different kinds of creative businesses as I was growing up. He was a drummer and he put together big bands, the Larry Wojcik Big Band, and he would bring together 5, 10, 15 people to go and play a music event in Michigan or around Michigan. And he would coordinate all that, take the payment from the company, pay everyone else, bring the music, bring all the, the audio equipment and that sort of thing. And I saw kind of the really long hours that my dad put in, the stress that came from the financial part of that, where things got slow in the wintertime, but really picked up in the summertime. And then my dad also did photography. So he did wedding photography. He did the photos for band in my school and portraiture and senior photos and that sort of thing. And so I saw, I saw the ebbs and flows of being an entrepreneur and how that could impact a family or the finances or the amount of time you get to spend and the late nights and that sort of thing away from your family. And so I thought that's what I didn't want, but I was then juxtapositioning the, the corporate job of potentially getting laid off at a moment's notice after putting in decades of hard work, time, your, your, your best years of your life for a company and then them kind of treating you that way to be like, hey, sorry, you're in the bottom X percent of people and we have to let you go for, for whatever reason. So I, I, I then kind of was opened up into this world of online business or people that were growing audiences through blogs or podcasts or video. And this was in 
2010, roughly, and I stumbled upon someone named Chris Gillibo. I think I found out about him through J.D. Roth of Get Rich Slowly, and he was talking about the art of nonconformity. That was his website's name. He was talking about quitting your job, traveling the world, uh, downsizing the stuff that you owned, and then I would stumble into minimalism uh, websites like Zen Habits by Leo Babauta, and all these people talking about non-normal lives, not your your desk jobs, your mortgage, your suburbs, uh, and all of that kind of stuff. So that really, really interested me because I was living in the suburbs of Seattle in a job I didn't really care for, going to my MBA program uh, at night during the week and working overtime during quarterly financial forecasting deadlines and things and just not really not really getting anything out of all this work that I was doing and all the energy I was putting into my job. And so all of the things that Chris was talking about and others were extremely attractive to me. And so there was one point where Chris's book came out, The Art of Nonconformity, his first book. And this was fall, late fall of 2010. I was traveling uh, to go somewhere for Thanksgiving uh, with my then fiance, Jen, and I picked up his book because I pre-ordered it right when it was announced. And so I had this book, I was reading it on the plane for this Thanksgiving trip. And it kind of like opened me up to what my life could be. Life of control, being in charge of your time, being in charge of when you can travel or take time off, being in charge of how much you can make and not having this ceiling of a two to 3% raise each year or being tied to a salary, even when you're working more hours and you would think you get paid more. I know some people have jobs where they don't. I, luckily I got paid overtime, but just this opening of this different kind of world that I didn't really know about. And I guess I was just naive or no one really shared it to me, or it was also just less well-known back then in 2010 that you could grow an audience online, sell digital courses or make money through advertising and be a digital nomad and live wherever you wanted and, and not have to work for a big company. And so after I read that book, Chris was on a book tour to promote the book. And he was coming to Seattle very shortly after that. I remember it was mid-December of of that year, 2010. And I wanted to tell Chris Gillibo the URL of my website that I was going to start to change my life, to change change the world. Uh, And I, I figured, okay, I've been learning a lot about personal finance. Maybe I should talk about that on my website. So I was thinking of different domain names and ran them by my fiance at the time. And Jen picked one out that I thought of called pocketchanged.com. And so I bought pocketchanged.com. I put the hello world WordPress blog post. If you've ever made a WordPress site from scratch, you know what I'm talking about. And I went to his book tour. And afterwards I waited in line, introduced myself, told him my URL, and, and that was kind of like the first step of me, like kind of committing to doing this thing. Fast forward a couple months, I had launched the site, started talking about my personal finance journey. I had by that point gotten out of debt entirely. So I kind of talked through how I did that and some of the nerdy spreadsheet stuff. And then I wrote daily for about 50 days on that website and Around that time, someone named Corbett Barr, who ran a site called Think Traffic, was launching a online course called Traffic School. It was a $500 investment, and he was going to teach how he had grown traffic to his website and how he's seen other people do the same and how to turn that traffic into subscribers and potentially customers. And this was something that I really wanted to join, but I was kind of afraid of that financial commitment. I hadn't really spent $500 on an online course before. I don't even know if I'd bought an online course at that point. And so I talked to her with my wife and I talked about how it would help me 
commit to making this blog thing a reality or trying to start a business. And so in March of 2011, I joined Traffic School with a bunch of other people and I took it very, very seriously. I was consuming all the things that Corbett shared. I started a mastermind group with a bunch of other people and I really focused on my blog and traffic and growing my network and that sort of thing. Now, that blog didn't necessarily make me much money. I did make some affiliate income or from the occasional ad or what have you. But what that did is it shifted my mindset a little bit to be like, okay, this desk job thing, this is not what I'm going to be doing for the next 20 or 30 years. I need to try to figure out this entrepreneurship thing. So I started reading every book I could possibly find about entrepreneurship, listening to podcasts about entrepreneurship. Funny thing, I actually heard of Corbett Barr the very first time on Pat Flynn's podcast of Smart Passive Income, who I'm now partnering with on SwitchPod and has been a client of mine for four years or so. So that's kind of a, a funny coincidence that I was driving to and from work listening to Pat Flynn. Then I heard Corbett on his show. And then shortly after that, I joined Traffic School. And and so I then eventually started to work for Corbett later that year. I met him at World Domination Summit, which is Chris Gillibo's event. That was the very first time that happened in uh, summer of 2011. I met Corbett at that event after going through traffic school. And shortly after that, he was looking to hire somebody that would be part-time, someone that would help him run his blog, Think Traffic and customer support email for his courses and things like that, because he was taking six weeks off uh, to travel through Europe with his wife. So I ended up getting that role, and that was part-time, about you know, half time, 20 hours a week or so. I did that on the side of my job at Boeing right after I got married and got back from my honeymoon. Did that for six weeks and it went well. And from there, he was looking to hire somebody full-time and he offered me a full-time job. And I left my job at Boeing September of 2011, which is seven and a half years ago. So I have a lot to get through in that time frame. But in the next three years or so, I worked with Corbett and we launched courses like Star Blog That Matters. We launched a new website called Expert Enough. And then Chase Reeves joined the team as well. And three of us launched fizzle.co, which is a training site and community for online entrepreneurs who are looking to grow their audience and try not to just burn out or fizzle out, that's where the name comes from, with, with their online business. And through all of that, I learned a ton about how to actually run a business as an entrepreneur. I went from a company of 140, 150,000 people down to working for one single entrepreneur where I was the only contractor that worked for him until Chase joined us and eventually Barrett Brooks joined us too. So I learned a lot about online business from Corbett, as well as from all the students in our courses, all the people that joined Fizzle, the people I interviewed for founder stories in Fizzle, the online courses I was making inside of Fizzle. And through all of that, I learned A, how to run a business, but B, I got back into video. I started filming courses for inside of Fizzle, filming multi multi-camera interviews for Fizzle, as well as just diving into filmmaking and tutorials online and taking in-person courses and learning from people like Still Motion or Vimeo Film School or what was it called? Vimeo. I think it's just called Vimeo Video School, learning from Wistia, all these other places that were teaching how to make better videos. There weren't as many people back then for sure in you know 2012, 13, and 14 when I was trying to learn this stuff. And so as I started to do more video as a part of my job, I also just fell back in love with it. I had made a few videos growing up. I remember making one in middle school for a church. I remember making another one in high school in my film studies class. And I remember making one on my own for another class in college where I played Waldo from Where's Waldo? And... He got in with the wrong crowd, and that's a strange video. Maybe I should bring that up sometime uh, and kind of critique it because I think that would be pretty hilarious uh, to to actually show that. I think it's I think it's fairly hidden on an older YouTube channel of mine, uh, but but I I'm sure I can find it and bring it back. Anyway, I played Waldo, and 
those were like once in middle school, once in high school, once in college, I made a video and I put so much time and effort into that thing. I remember scripting them. I remember filming them. I was kind of the DP at that point with whatever camcorder with tapes in it we had at the time. I remember being the one in the lab on the computer with my team behind me doing the editing and figuring out how to do edits properly. And I don't know why, but at the time then it didn't click to me that, Hey, you really like this video thing. You should, you should do this. You should try this. There weren't the kind of opportunities that there are now for distribution like YouTube and faster internet speeds and, and phones and things that people used to watch video. That wasn't a thing back then. It was TV and movies. And those were the, those were kind of the two paths. And I didn't really want to work in either of those partially because of what people said about them and how hard they were to break into. So I've made those three videos and then I got really into video when I was working at Fizzle. And at that point I started to get the itch again to run my own thing. I initially left Boeing to work with Corbett because that was like the stepping stone for me to get get out of my desk job and to learn from somebody that actually knows how to run a business on a smaller scale. I wasn't really thinking that I would then move on to do video. I had no idea at that point what I would do next. I did continue my blog going, Pocket Change, for a while. I started talking more about entrepreneurship, interviewing other solo entrepreneurs. I had a podcast called Cubicle Renegade and did about 25 episodes of that. And all this time, I'm just kind of learning and learning and trying to read more books about entrepreneurship, read more uh, biographies about people that started businesses and just get more connected with other people at conferences and just online through Twitter or commenting on their blogs with, with entrepreneurs, with people that had businesses that I wanted to have or types of businesses that I wanted to have where they could be location independent if they wanted to be, they were in charge of their own hours. They maybe had teams that were virtual. They could travel wherever they wanted, whenever they wanted. Those were the types of things I wanted. I knew that having a blog, having an audience or having clients that you could work with virtually was the way to do that. And basically came to a point at Fizzle where I wanted to run my own thing. And that meant I had to leave. And the the skill that I had was video. And the connections that I had were with other online entrepreneurs and people that ran software companies that were at a bunch of the events that I had been going to, like New Media Expo or NAB or Social Media Marketing World or World Domination Summit or Wistia Fest. And some of these events that I was going to as an attendee or to speak at, there were other online entrepreneurs at those events that I became friends with. And they needed video because video was becoming more and more popular. And this was in about 2014. And through that kind of timing of wanting to run my own thing and having video skills and having these connections with bloggers and podcasters that kind of wanted to get into video, those were my first clients. And so told Corbett and Chase that I was leaving Fizzle. I think I had six or seven weeks to kind of drum up some client work. And my wife was building her wedding photography business at that point. So there wasn't really other much other income coming in. And that, so we're basically back against the wall, need to make it happen. And so I made a list of the top 10 people that I wanted to work with the most. And I emailed all of them. And I really only needed two or three to, to hire me in the first month or two to work together. And luckily I got two or three of them in the first couple months. So made some videos for Gumroad, uh, some videos for Scott Dinsmore, and I started doing some stuff for Pat Flynn. And just here and there, I was finding clients in my existing network that, that needed video stuff done. And that was about four and a half years ago at this point, almost exactly. And since then, I've continued to keep working with similar clientele, people that have online audiences and are maybe 
trying to grow a YouTube presence. So they need a lot of YouTube videos. Maybe they're launching a product, a Kickstarter or uh, another course or something like that, or they need an online course filmed, or maybe they have a live event. Like I filmed some live events for Sean McCabe of Sean Wes and for ConvertKit, uh, the craft and commerce conference. And I've done some documentary work with ConvertKit as well and with Pat Flynn of Smart Passive Income when he went to Ghana for Pencils of Promise to see the schools that he had fundraised to, to build over there. And my clientele has basically stayed in that same kind of network of people that have online audiences and are trying to grow those audiences or to further serve them through products or courses or showcasing their your, their customers through testimonials and that sort of thing. So that's kind of the overarching story of how I got to where I am today with running my client business. Uh, my, my full-time editor is also my brother-in-law. So my wife's brother, Tim, is someone that if you've been following me and my YouTube channel for a while or even listened to older episodes of the podcast before I put it on pause, you've heard or seen Tim. And he's been instrumental in being able to build the business that I want to build. And he did live in, in an extra room of our apartment when he first started doing stuff for me. I had a course launch and he wanted to make some extra money. And so I had him I basically showed him how to use Final Cut and edit with me for my course launch. He ended up getting a client from that and then started doing some stuff part-time for me and eventually full-time. And he's been working with me for the last three, four years um, now. And so having him and then me and then my wife also helps occasionally with things. She will go with me to shoots sometimes she'll she'll travel with me help me uh schlep all the gear as we call it and and help me film as well as she's been very very helpful for all of the switch pod launch stuff as well she's helped a lot with the photography and the photo editing and getting the kickstarter page ready for switch pod and she also has built up her photography business she did portraits and weddings and she's kind of transitioned into running a stock photography uh membership service called sourced co with a few of her friends and so along this whole journey we've we've really emphasized the freedom and flexibility to be able to travel as much as we want which for us is taking one full month off each year which we've been able to do three of the last four years which has been awesome but also being in charge of your time means Sometimes you work a little more. So I would say I put in way more hours, way more times, some nights, some weekends, lots more travel than I ever did at my desk job in Boeing. But I'm also way more in control of those decisions. So when someone else is telling you that you need to work 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week and you don't want to, that's different than you wanting to work those additional hours to do a great job or to deliver for your clients or to make extra content that doesn't make a bunch of money like this podcast episode, but that you enjoy doing and you want to continue investing in sharing your story and growing your audience and, and growing your business. So I don't know how to take my journey there. I, I had a bunch of a bunch of notes and I just kind of didn't look at them at all. I mostly talked about everything, but I think the biggest part of my journey that has really been something that makes sense connecting the dots going backwards is that I was always just an independent kind of kid. I was okay spending time by myself at home after school playing video games or learning how to build a computer or, you know, shoveling the driveway just so I could play basketball in the wintertime by myself in the driveway. And that kind of independence carries through to today with not wanting to work at a major corporation with over 100,000 people dictating what I do each day or how much money I can make or 
where I have to live. And then now being my own boss, even though I have clients and I have people to answer to and that sort of thing because they pay me, but I'm in charge of which clients I work with and which projects I take on and where I travel to and where I live and how I spend my time and what I'm interested in. And so that independence is kind of this thread that's been through my whole story, I would say. And I would, I would just kind of encourage you to try to find some sort of trait that's within you through, I'm trying not to get too woo woo on you here, but it, it doesn't make sense to try to figure out what you want to do in my mind. You know, where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in 10 years? It's helpful to have a general idea of that, but what really gets you there is action and one day at a time. And so it's hard to connect dots going forward, but it's easier to connect them going backwards. So I would encourage you to try to look for a trait that goes backwards, that goes back to maybe your time in college or university or even younger when you were growing up, something that really defines who you are that also aligns with the kind of life you want to live. So to me, that's independence, self-reliance, continuing to learn about different things. You know, I didn't always put a lot of time and energy into growing a business or learning about video production or trying to get better at art or being in front of a camera or things like that. I put thousands of hours, tens of thousands of hours probably into playing video games growing up. And I put thousands of hours into playing sports growing up. I don't do either of those things now. Occasionally I might play a video game or I might shoot hoops at the, at the Y or something like that. But I put a lot of time and energy and my parents put a lot of money into sports for me, going to camps and uniforms and everything, driving, driving around to different games. And I put a lot of time and money into buying video games and playing video games and getting really good at them and moving on to the next one. And neither of those things necessarily help me earn a living today, living in my, living in my thirties, but being independent and being someone that was more of a self-starter and being someone that really took those things seriously and tried to learn as much as I could. I remember reading Nintendo Power and gamer guides to try to get even better at games and reading forums about how to build my own computer and when it didn't turn on, trying to figure out why the jumper was in the wrong spot. And I think that I didn't get what I what I needed from, from school, from teachers. School and teachers were fine. They were, they were great. And, uh, I got good grades, but I, I was just bored a lot. I think that, I don't know if I, if I was in a school that maybe enabled different speeds of people to take classes and stuff that were above where they were supposed to be. And I did that with math and some other things, but I think I just got bored because I wasn't that interested in it. And once I found something I was really interested in, like sports or video games or now video and photo stuff, I, I obsess about it. I spend my free time learning about it and watching behind the scenes videos of how movies were made and reading American Cinematography Magazine after I finished watching a show like Homecoming on Amazon, which is something I just finished. And wanting to learn about what lenses they used and why they had the weird focusing effect. And I would just encourage you, whatever, whatever it is you really, re really like, just lean, lean into that and don't be afraid of like burning out on it. I've always heard that, oh, if you want to, if you want to ruin a hobby, make it your job. And I can, I can understand that to some effect because you could really enjoy doing something like baking, for example, but if you bake when you want to, that's different than baking every single day, waking up at 4 a.m., 
making sure you have all the pastries out by the time people come in. So I can, I can understand the grind of having to do something over and over and over again. But I think that advice keeps people from actually pursuing something that they're interested in. So yeah, I think I'm going to wrap up this episode right there. That's a bit about who I am, who Caleb Logic is, my journey into running my own business, making YouTube videos about cameras and uh, in, co-inventing SwitchPod with Pat and, you know, kind of seeing where where the rest of this podcast and the rest of my career goes, who knows. But I think it is interesting to hear someone's story and how the dots kind of connect going backwards. And I just wanted to share a little bit about who I am and, and where I came from. So if you enjoyed this episode, I would love for you to rate, review, and subscribe on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. And I do still plan to continue doing these on video as well. It's definitely more work to set up lights and cameras and do the editing that way. But you can also watch these on YouTube as well. And I appreciate you if you've made it this far. And uh, send me a note. Send me a note on Twitter or Instagram or email. I'm at Caleb Logic. Um, or you can use my email, caleb at calebwagic.com to let me know uh, if there was something from this that resonated with you. So I appreciate you. Looking forward to talking with you in a, in a future episode. I've been Caleb Logic, and I'll see you another one. Cheers. <laughs>